All right, thank you, Karen. You, you can hear me. All right. So if you've been reading any of these mainstream business books, you are probably under the impression that machines are going to take over the world and leave us humans without jobs. Uh, some, such as um, Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, they even go on to say that AI poses an ex existential threat to humans. All right, well, this isn't going to be such a talk. This is not about the tensions between machines and humans. This is about combining them to produce new capabilities. So we're going to jump into this. We're going to start with the very familiar machine learning task of the recommender system. So over there on the left, we have a screenshot from Amazon. The top portion is probably using a collaborative filtering algorithm. The bottom part is probably an affinities algorithm. Now, us consumers, we've gotten used to this. We rely on this for navigation and discovery when we shop online. But we still go to stores, and when we do so, we get a very different experience. We get this, the knowledgeable, knowledgeable sales associate that helps us. And when she does this, a similar task, but she performs her duties in a very different way. There's some that will argue that one is better than the other, um, and I'm here to tell you they're just not even comparable. They do their tasks completely differently. Let's uh, demonstrate this. So th these things, machines, humans, have very different capabilities. Um, to prove that, we're going to do two tasks. Looking around the room, mostly appear to be human. So we're going to ask to perform two tasks here. When you know the answer, just raise your hand so I can see it. I like to tally these up. OK, so task number one, find the eigenvectors in this matrix. Put those hands up high when you know it. Nobody? All right, there's usually one or two smart asses that think they can do this. Um, and the truth is, you could all do it. It just takes a lot of rote calculations. If you've ever taken a graduate course in mathematics, they make you do a couple of these by hand, and then you'll never do it again. And it's never on a size like this. It's usually a two by two matrix or a three by three. It takes a lot of rote calculations. And you're going to get bored out of your mind. You're going to make mistakes along the way. But to a machine, they could, this can be done in milliseconds and done flawlessly. OK, so we'll try task two. I think you'll find this a little bit better suited for your particular talents. Find the leopard print dress. We got a hand. Anybody else see it? OK, well, all right. This is much easier for you humans. Um, you're not fooled by the fact that it was blue, right? But machines, they struggle with this. Unless they had leopard print dogs and blue dresses in their training sets, it's actually a tricky one to get right. Um, us humans, we don't struggle. We got it right away. We didn't think about the blue thing, um, and we weren't fooled by the other parts. We have this ability to relate to other humans. We, can, we have knowledge of social norms, and we have the ability to improvise. To be honest, that's not even a leopard print dress. That is Jaguar. But we know what is meant when somebody asks for a leopard print dress, that Jaguar, even cheetah, will suffice. Um, machines struggle with this. They don't know how to improvise. They sometimes take things a little too literally. So there should be very little doubt that these two processors have very different capabilities. We think of the human brain as a processor. There's certain tasks that it, it can do better than a machine. So if I had a task that required a lot of rote calculations, I would route that to an appropriate device, uh, in this case, a machine. But if I had another task, say, finding blue dresses, that task is going to be better performed by a human. And this notion that we can leverage human brains as a processor is not a new one. This is a, a picture from the 1940s. This, these were computers. If you were to say, I need a computer, they would say, well, would you like Sally there or Jeff, Fred? Which one do you want? This was literally what computers were. We didn't introduce that prefix digital computers to like the 50s. All right. These were um, men and women who uh, jobs it was to add up long strings of numbers or multiply them together. They were quite literally computers. So you'd hand them a string of numbers, and you say add them up, and they would, in an hour or so, hand them back. They were entry-level jobs into research positions. Now, today we use human computation, but in two very distinct uh, or very different ways than we did back then. So number one, they know we don't have to gather them up anymore in rooms like this. We have connected devices. We can access humans wherever we want. They could be anywhere in the world. We can ask them to perform tasks. Um, and so uh, we've gone away with any type of work hours or um, you know, geographic locations that you have to be. 
The second distinction is we no longer use humans for doing rote calculations. They are far less efficient than machines. We do use them to do the things that humans can do, such as um, leverage uh, their knowledge of social norms or the ability to relate to other humans or their ability to improvise. So these two resources, machines and humans, can be combined to produce new capabilities. You can combine them into a workflow. You have access to both processors, right? And so you can have a machine task that chugs along doing its calculations, then it stops because it hits some point where I think I need a human for this, and it will you know, reach out to humans, get their response back, and then keep chugging along the way. You can incorporate them into your workflow. So there's precedence for this. Um, precedence, oh, sorry, what, Combining them, what we're shooting for here is to actually um, produce a capability that's better than either one can do on their own. And so this is where there's precedence. The, the game of chess here was long held as perhaps the ultimate demonstration of human thinking abilities. That is until 1997 when Gary Kasparov, the world-renowned chess champion, lost to Deep Blue, which was a supercomputer built by IBM. Now, this was just a matter of time. Even Kasparov wasn't surprised by this. The human brain is just no match for the computational speed and the brute force methods of a supercomputer. It was bound to happen. But something interesting emerged after this. Something called freestyle chess began to show up. Freestyle chess is where the chess player can use a device of his or her own, usually a much more modest device than a supercomputer, but they can collaborate with a device to do the calculations and they team up and they can now beat a supercomputer. So machine, human combined can beat the best supercomputers. Kasparov himself did this and he found it really interesting. He said, gosh, when I, ha when I seed all the calculations to a machine, it frees me up to focus on the more creative aspects of the game. And so this is how they're combining to beat supercomputers, because the computer's only the supercomputer is only going to do the one thing, the rote calculations. So it turns out there are commercial applications for this as well. And I happen to work for Stitch Fix, this company. Has anybody heard of Stitch Fix before? We got mostly female hands, a couple guys. All right, we do guys clothes now. We just launched that uh, this week, in fact. Um, so Stitch Fix is e-commerce. It's shopping. You buy clothes from us but with a very important difference. You don't pick out the merchandise yourself. There's no shopping on our website. Nowhere on our site will you find a product page or a search box or a browse page. You won't even get recommendations on the site. At Stitch Fix, you do not pick out the merchandise. And this is the value proposition. There's a lot of people out there that don't want to shop. They don't have time or they don't know what's currently in style or what might look good on their bodies or what's appropriate for the age. They want help with this. And so they outsource it to us. They say, can you do this for me? And so we do. So here's how it works, um, if you're unfamiliar with it. So if you were to become a Stitch Fix customer, the first thing we're gonna ask you to do is fill out this long style profile. This is where we collect a lot of information about you. You gotta tell us your height, your weight, your size, your preferences for fit, your preferences for style. You can even write us a little note if you want that describes elements of your lifestyle that may be pertinent for us to pick out clothes for you. A lot of people choose to make Pinterest pin boards as examples of things they like uh, um, and they want to share them with us. So we collect all this data up front and then an algorithm runs, one that uses varied resources to leverage every bit of that data that you told us about to pick out five things for you. And then we're going to ship them to you, sight unseen. We don't show you a preview or anything like that. We just ship it. And you're under no obligation to, this is a, these are recommendations, there are no obligation to keep things, but you will get that, you'll see the stuff when it hits your doorstep and you can open the box and you can then experience the clothes. You can try them on the privacy of your own home with your own shoes and wardrobe and get feedback from a loved one. All right, you have no obligation to keep the stuff. You tell us what you like and they're gonna keep. You can send the rest back, you can send it all back. It's free shipping both ways, that's on us. So that's how it works. It is a recommendation engine, but with a much greater commitment because we're going to physically deliver it. So lots of companies use recommender systems. Some use it for incremental sales. Others use it as a means of engagement. And others still use it as their primary vehicle for discovery. But at Stitch Fix, this is everything. There is no other way to buy clothes from Stitch Fix. You're, you're going to get it from us. We're going to pick things out for you, and it better be right. right. So unlike these other three companies at the top, we have severe penalties for when we get it wrong. Right? 
I've worked at these companies. Um, when you get it wrong, eh, you kind of shrug your shoulder, you don't spit out your coffee, right? You're, you're, I'll fix that later, right? There's the harm in a, the incremental damage of a poor recommendation is like a shoulder shrug for both the customer and the company. Now, if you do it long enough, persistent enough, you stand to lose a lot, as you can see from those numbers. But any one bad recommendation is no big deal. But at Stitch Fix, this is, this is meaningful, right? We're paying shipping both ways on this stuff. We've got the cost of that inventory being out, and we've got an upset customer. She may have been waiting for, you know, on this stuff for some event, and she's not laughing about this. Oh, you guys, right? We all get the goofy uh, Netflix recommendations once in a while, or Amazon, you buy something for your niece or nephew and forever plagued with kid toys, right? No big deal for us. It's a big deal. So we, we have to leverage every bit of processing we get our hands on, machines and humans, and we've incorporated them into our workflow. So I'm going to show you how this works. Uh, let's see, far left there, you have our machine resources. And then we have our human resources, human compute resources. Uh, we also have some resources we do our own warehousing logistics so we can control this experience for the customer. Now, thanks to Amazon's web services, we have nearly infinite access to machines. We use all the cloud computing we can get our hands on. We've amassed our own um, compute resources on the, of the human type. Right? We have 3,000 stylists that we employ. They're actually real employees. And this is not um, lay tasks like Mechanical Turk. These are skilled tasks. These are all fashionistas that like doing this. They want to help people with their wardrobe. And they are all work from home. So they're scattered around the country. And we route tasks to them um, when we need to. So uh, the two of those combine compose the algorithm. Right? We have certain tasks that need to be executed by machines. And certain tasks, ah, we're going to need a human for that. And so we combine their unique talents to produce a new capability. So here's how it works. Um, oh, by the way, machines and humans have very different work styles. We're going to have to use this queuing system to coordinate their activities, because machines work very fast, and they're nearly infatigable. Us humans, eh, we're a little slower. We need to take breaks. We go to sleep, things like that. So we use a queuing mechanism to coordinate their activities. So here's how it works. That's a customer there. If she wants a shipment of clothing, all she really needs to do after she's filled out that style profile, once she's got that done, all she has to do is periodically, whenever she chooses, say, yes, send me stuff. And she picks a date. That creates this shipment request. Now, I'm going to be showing a bunch of algorithms. They're represented by letters. Um, most of them are going to be machine only. I'll show you the one part that blends the human element into it. So first thing is, we're going to have to take that shipment request and route it to one of those work queues. We have different distribution centers around the country, and we want to pick one that's going to have the best merchandise for that customer, and perhaps we'll take into account proximity if we want to uh, get it to her fast, that type of thing. So there's an algorithm that runs that figures out we're going to take that work queue, and it's going to put it in there. Now, first thing we're going to do is route this over to machines. Um, important that machine processing happens first. The human element is far more expensive, so we want to reduce the workload on them. So we route the, the shipment over to machines to perform what we call the M algorithm, M for machine. And this is where all the things that you can do with rote calculations happen. So we have things like PCA and SVD. These are algorithms to find the directions in the data that explain the most variability. We have matrix factorization that help detect latent features that explain why people might buy something. And we have mixed effects models that capture interactions between product attributes and customer attributes. And then we have artificial intelligence and deep learnings that really handle mostly the image and text data. Now, these things quite literally entail billions of calculations. Hence, we're going to use the machines on this, right? They're far more efficient at rote calculations. So literally billions of calculations happen. What they're doing is they're taking this customer and they're comparing it to every piece of inventory we have and saying, how relevant is it for her along hundreds of axes of dimensions? So what they do is they end up rank, they eliminate a lot of inventory from candidacy. So this is just not good for her. What's left is they rank order it and return it back to the queue. They've done a lot of processing, but we haven't exhausted all the processing we can do, right? We still have things that require human computation. So it routes that list back into the queue where a human's going to pick it up. Not just any human. We have another machine-only algorithm, G, that's going to pick which of those humans is the best chance of success for that 
particular customer. They take into account relationships that they may have. They take into account affinities between them, even proximity. Maybe if she lives in Texas and our stylist lives in Texas, they might, she might better know the local um, trends going on there, right? So we take all that into account. We ultimately pick one of these um, 3,000 stylists to route the shipment to, to say, We've already done the machine side of these things, go through these recommendations and curate from there. So she performs all the things that only a human can do. She improvises, she curates, she uses her knowledge of social norms, she uses her ability to relate to other humans. These are all uniquely in the purview of humans. So she ultimately narrows this down to exactly five items and she puts it back to the queue. From there, a signal is sent to our logistics system where our warehouse workers will do the pick, pack, and ship. They're gonna turn that information into physical products. They wrap it up beautifully, tissue paper, and put it in a box, and they ship it out to her. This provides all the benefits of home try-on, and um, it actually enables feedback for us, um, but a lot of convenience, benefits, and so forth. So it's about more. It's not just using machines. It's about also humans combining their unique talents to produce a new capability, as well as other benefits, and all that stuff adds up to make her very happy. So one thing I wanna clarify on that last slide, I alluded to this fact that, oh, I get it, machines do some tasks and humans do others, and that is true. We have some tasks that are exclusively on one side or the other but there's also this concept of shared tasks where they can further combine on things. Here's an example. We, um, there's a note right there, so our customers write in notes, of, you know, elaborating on what kind of things they might be interested in. This customer says, I'd like something casual that I can also wear to the office. All right, this is good information, it's good signal, you're gonna have to take that into account when you do your recommendations for her. So we have this task called process request note, and we pass in the argument of the request note. Now that is gonna be a shared task because both play a role. Our machines can do some amazing things with this. So every time we ship out clothes to a customer, she gives us uh, feedback. She writes little notes about what they thought of this stuff. We have millions of past shipments and each one of those contains five products. Um, and so we have millions and millions of text written about our products. And some customers will write things like, oh, I love this blouse. I was able to wear it to the park and then go to my law firm in the afternoon. Ooh, that sounds similar to what this customer is looking for, something casual that she could also wear to the office. So she didn't use those same words, but we use natural language processing. Here we're using uh, LDA, it stands for Latent Dirichlet Allocation. And this is gonna go look through millions of past shipments to find items where people said something similar to that about the item. And those are gonna be good candidates to recommend to this customer. So it does those things, now that requires billions of rote calculations. NLP is actually a very computational expensive routine to run. So we do that on machines. And they will come back, luckily, in milliseconds and return a bunch of candidate results. But we are not done there. We have human judgment that we can leverage. So we route the task down to our human, um, and re this is a curation task, so we have some candidate things that match our criteria, and we're gonna pass that down, and she's gonna look at them, and she's gonna apply her, her knowledge of social norms, her ability to relate to other humans, and her ability to improvise, and she'll pick one of those things, and indeed, we do have something that looks casual, but appropriate to wear to the office. Uh, one more example of a shared task, um, images, right? So we all love to, pin things on Pinterest these days. And often it's much easier to express your preferences by poking on an image of something you like rather than trying to describe it in words, right? So most of our customers give us Pinterest print boards and they make us wonderful examples of things they're looking for. So we can take those things. Again, this is gonna be a shared task. Machines play a role and humans. So she pins this image and we're gonna say, okay, what do we have that's similar to that? And we have images up the yin yang in our products. We, take, we photograph everything and we do lots of computational things to remove backgrounds and make sure we're isolating just, in this case, the sweater. Um, but we're gonna pass that down to machines to run what we call convolutional neural networks. And what we've done is they vectorize the image and they compare it to all the images we have of products that we own and they find the closest matches. So meaning closest meaning visually similar. So it runs on machine hardware because it's millions of rote calculations and it returns a bunch of candidates, but again, we're not done there. We want to layer on human judgment here. 
And so that runs on human hardware, and she's going to, again, use her ability to improvise knowledge of social norms, et cetera, and she returns something that indeed looks similar. If I pinned that on Pinterest and I got that, that would be a pretty good match. And these are actually real examples. Um, so that's interesting that we are sharing, even at the task level, uh, machines and humans are sharing their workload. Um, and this is important that you train them well because what we're shooting for is additive results. What we're hypothesizing here is that um, S is a styling algorithm. A styling algorithm composed of human and machine resources is going to be better than one composed of human only or machine only. That is, we're shooting for synergy here. We want to combine their unique talents. So we want uh, to, to their additive results plus synergy. Now, for this to be true, two things have to ha happen. We need both humans and machines to make non-zero contributions. And then the second line means those contributions have to be different. If they're doing the same thing, we're not going to get additive results. So we're trying to separate them. We're not trying to train machines to think like a human, nor are we trying to train humans to think like machines. We want their unique talents, and we want to combine them additively. So training is interesting. Machines, it's actually straightforward. There's a lot of literature out here on how to do machine learning, how to train machines. You've got things like back propagation and cross-fold validation, feature selection, regularization. These are all tried and true methods, and we use them all. More interesting is on the human side, because this H algorithm runs up here on human hardware. And it, we all use an algorithm in our head when we make any decision. And those, Algorithms are built up over a lifetime of experiences and observations. They could even contain bias. And we need to know how that works, but it's hidden to us. We can't even ask one of our stylists to explain what it is they do. They don't know. They just kind of do what feels right. So we can learn it. We can learn it by subtly changing the information we sow our style. So we recommend the machine recommendations get presented to them in this interface. We subtly vary a lot of the information that we're showing them to see what matters to them what makes, what improves their decision making and what might make it worse. And this is very important because you want to make sure that every bit of that human judgment is additive, that it's complementary to that of the machines. Because again, if you're doing the same thing, we're not getting additive results. So we always want to make sure it's positive and additive to that of the machines. All right, so there's five benefits that I'm going to outlay for you on combining machines with humans. We talked about number one already, the additive results. Um, number two is scale, and this is the one that's not obvious to a lot of people. A lot of people may bind to the fact, great, I understand machines plus humans is going to be better than either one, but how the heck are you going to make this scale? Humans are expensive, and they are, but the key is t coupling them with technology. So first, I've already mentioned how we do Machine processing first, it cuts down on the workload for humans. So we specialize their task to only the things that the humans can do. So that makes them efficient in the economic sense of efficient, meaning they provide more value than they cost. So once you have that, then it's a matter of scaling them. Linear scaling or sublinear scaling is fine. You just roll them out. Now what we've done here is we've achieved complete linear scale. So that means no idle time. Uh, this is the part that's often unintuitive. But so if you think about the analog version of our stylus, which is the store associate. So if you go down to a store, if you went right now, like whatever time it is, 3.15 or something, if you go down to a store, your chances are you'll see employees in there. And they're probably polishing countertops because there's really not much else to do in there. There's no customers. They have the employees there in case a customer walks in. But very little of their time is spent actually engaging with a the customer. They're usually waiting or folding clothes, that kind of thing. By contrast, our stylists only work on real shipments. We do not call on them to go polish countertops. They sit until there's a task. We route the task to them. They perform their duties. So they're always effective. Um, elastic. Just like our machines in Amazon's cloud, we can expand or contract them whenever we need more or less of them. Same thing goes for humans. We can expand or contract as the workload permits. Now, most of the time, we're just expanding, trying to get more of them. Um, if we ever had a slow time, we can certainly route fewer tasks to them. So they're totally elastic. And lastly, they're linear without step functions. Let's go back to the store analogy um, or any workforce of employees that you might need to hire. They are linear. You, you, you add them, and you get linear costs going up. But then there's big step functions that happen, because sooner or later, you run out of physical space, and you have to open another store or another office, right? And so you have these step functions of cost. We avoid that. We hit 100% linear scaling 
by letting them work from home and reroute the tasks to them. If we need another thousand styles, we'll get them and they'll be at home, no office space. So that's how scale works. Uh, next is feedback. Um, now, of course, we get feedback from the customer and that informs both machines and humans. But because we put them in the same system, machines and humans, they share feedback with each other. And they do this passively. As the, our human styles are performing their jobs, right? We, we show them a bunch of information in this custom interface we built, and we're logging the crap out of this thing. We're recording everything they're doing, how long it takes to perform their tasks. We're recording, did they pick high on the list of recommendations or did they skip over things? All this is feedback to machines to help them get better. Likewise, machines inform the stylist of the outcome of their decision. They keep good statistics on everything. Um, and it's amazing how uh, informative this could be. You may think you're really good at styling 40-year-olds um, in Utah, and it turns out you're not great at those, right? You need this feedback to get better. And so the two of them are constantly providing feedback passively. You don't have to ask them to do anything, it's just going to happen. And so that feedback loop is so tight and inexpensive that it naturally gets smarter over time. And next is controlled variation. This is a little bit of an esoteric topic, but as you get better at something, you tend to do more of it and you tend to do less of what doesn't seem to work. And that's great, and you're supposed to do that, but that can be detrimental over a long term. You could narrow yourself into, I don't know if you guys heard the term, the filter bubble. Uh, recommendation engines tend to figure out what it is you like and then only do that. And what you have other interests too. You have to constantly be exploring. So an example might be, suppose we had a jacket and we've learned that it works really well with this particular type of customer. And so we send it and it's successful. Well, we get a new jacket in. How do we know that new jacket might not be even better? You have to explore these things. You're gonna to have to push a little. Um, customers have preferences that need to be explored. Sometimes they'll tell you something, I'm preppy, I will never wear anything that isn't preppy. You take a risk, you send her something edgy, and it turns out she'll love it sometimes, right? So you have to take these risks to keep learning. Now, it's very hard to ask a human to take some risks or to do something randomly. We are not equipped with random number generators in our heads. Now, the more conventional way of doing this is you, you, you favor optimism, right? So you're calculating things, probability that she's gonna buy these things, and those come with confidence intervals, and technically what you wanna do is take the upper bound of the confidence interval so that you favor optimism until you know otherwise. Those are hard calculations to do. Us humans aren't gonna do them, but we can do that with machines. And so we can inject the variation by way of the machines, and we can influence our humans to help them take some risks when appropriate. So that's controlled exploration. And finally, um, we'll have time for questions after this, um, is specialization. Now, the division of labor is wildly held as the source of all economic growth. But in this case, we are dividing our labor with machines and that worries us. But you gotta think about this. What does that leave us humans to specialize in? What do we get to do more of? Well, this becomes an important part of the program for our stylist. Um, because we don't ask them to do the rote calculations, they find that they are more freed up to focus on the more creative aspects of the game. And this is important, because our customers sometimes write in notes like this one. She says, my husband is returning home from a tour in Iraq. He is disabled. I would love something for a very special date night. Now, our stylists are very much real human beings, and they know what this means, right, what this event means to the customer. And sometimes they are compelled to provide more than their styling services. They may write a little note back to the customer. They may thank her for her husband's sacrifice. They may send gifts or little you know, flowers or something like that. So in essence, because they don't have to do those rote tasks, they are specializing in what we do best relating to other humans. So we are creating more human humans by seeding tasks to machines. And that's all I got. Thank you very much.